So welcome again to Quantum Creativity Show with Santare Green and Cesarina Tron. We are so pleased to have a different kind of interview today where our guest is actually in, um, in my own space <laughs> with me here. <laughs> so, um, which is unusual. We usually just do this from different parts of our own world. Uh, in the front of our computers, so this is very special. <laughs> yes, side by side. Thank you. <laughs> so, what is the nature of the interview today, Cesarina? Well, today um, on our Quantum Creativity show, we want to explore and stir up a little more creativity in any people out there who are working with children, any teachers, any adults who are passionate to empower children because um, the time we believe the time has come for that. It's just um, it's very easy and very uh, much in the moment if we just apply it to practical life. And um, that's why Laura Love uh, Rillinger, Rillinger is with me <laughs> here today. Um, she um, has lots to share her wisdom in the classroom and beyond the classroom. And um, and I'm very privileged to know her and have met her um, this spring of 2015 through my um, Mirador Kids Yoga Teacher Training and Creativity Coaching um, Certification Program. So here we are. We have lots to share, and it includes you, Santari, as well, because <laughs> of your beautiful work, <laughs> which is our mandatory reading for the course, for the training. So. Okay. So let's just dive straight in there. I mean, this is um, about a magica, this magical story. It's amazing. Mm -hmm piece of work, which is really about something about my life and really about what I see as energy and transformation and movement of consciousness. So I'd be really interested to find out um, what is it that you find particularly interesting in reading the book and how has it moved you and how perhaps are you using it um, with children yourself? Um, so when I first read the book, although I know it was something that you personally wrote, like you said, you connected to it. I also connected to it. And while personally, um, I've never felt a strong connection to dragons, I felt a strong connection to other mythical creatures. Um, whenever I got to a point when I was reading, because this was several places throughout the book when, um, you know, your character, Centauri, would already know an answer. And there wouldn't be any other type of um, information given to them. It was something deeply embedded within them it was very intuitive and i read that and say oh my gosh he's right <laughs> like <laughs> this is so true it, it, it just kind of um, made me feel i guess um more confident with my faith and my own intuition and it like it honestly made me feel more brave to trust um that i already have answers and i don't always have to go out looking for them that they're already within me um, and that I feel that was something I noticed throughout the book. That was a constant um, theme, and that was something huge I took from it. And um, you know, I, I don't deliberately teach that or share that with my students, but it is something that I'll bring up, which is hard though in a classroom because I am supposed to be the one to give them the answers, and they're supposed to be the ones to take the information and regurgitate it. Um, but I also have the flexibility because I, I teach um, social studies, which is a mixture of culture and religion and geography and someone's population, all sorts of cool stuff there. And then language arts, which is you know, reading and different genres and writing different genres. And so they are able to, um, you know, give out their own information as well. And so it isn't always about regurgitating what I, I give them. It's about them finding their own answers. And so I'm trying to mm. have them, you know, learn within themselves mm -hmm. instead of, is this right, is this right, is this right? Like, well, don't worry if it's right or wrong right now. Let's just work on the process. Let's work on the process. How do you feel about it? And so whenever they ask those questions, is it right or is it wrong? I try to reflect that back to them and just let them enjoy the learning process mm -hmm. and learn you know, enjoy the writing process, whatever it is that we're doing, um, and, and have them try to tune into themselves 
And I think that also creates a, a love of learning mm -hmm. when they're not so concerned of what's right or wrong, just the process. Um, and so that was a huge thing that I brought, I got from the book, definitely. It's just to trust your own intuition and trust your own mm -hmm. instincts. Yeah, the answers are here, not always out there. So it totally makes sense for me to put that book into the program. Oh, yeah. Because that was my first, yeah, when, when I, um, you know, got in touch with the book myself, I actually got a copy from Santari himself when I visited him, um, was it a couple of summers ago? Um, and at that point, we had been doing this show, this quantum creativity show for three years, and we never met a person. So finally, I made my trip to go to London, to go to UK, and then go travel from London to Burgess Hill, and, um, and spend a few, a couple of days with Santari, walking, chatting, talking, and I got the book, and, and I was just like a child, a magical child, you know, bursting with joy. I had the book, the magical book. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then I you know I really started to appreciate and see the potential for that. This is not only you know a lot of people might look at uh, Imagica as a fantasy book, so it's just for people who love fantasy. Fantasy is not something that we use in our normal life, and you know people might say, and I would totally disagree and say, oh, you need more of that every day, mm -hmm. because then if you can bring some of that uh, power of the invisible of the imagination, which a lot of visionaries of the world, Einstein and the geniuses and the, and the musicians, they all have brought what we need, what we have today from those realms of the imagination and the power and the, you know, whatever you want to call them, fantasy, if, if it serves you. But those are powerful realms of being and you bring them here into the practical life to anchor them, to embody them. Uh, Santari's body of work is sourcing physicality. So you're sourcing your physical self Mm -hmm. So you're finding all the potential that's there for you to express through this physical body, through this mind, through these emotions, through everything. Well, that's a really good tool. So when I, when I saw that potential, I got so excited uh, in the spring as we're starting the training with the teachers. And I said, we have to read this book. I'm making this book mandatory. Of course, I couldn't ask them to finish it by by a certain time because we got the book a little late in our first um, training. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, you know, it was just being a uh, Santari actually just made it available this year, which is at Amazon, uh, which is in US, which is wonderful because before you had to actually get it from UK. So, um, what a great gift, I think, Santari to, um, to self and to the world and to the timing to today to the moment of now where people are going through this huge shift now, awakening and looking at these paradigms, new paradigms, not just in education, but new paradigms of life, new paradigms of being, of well, how do I lead a life that's meaningful? How do I trust myself? How do I have more creativity? Well, guess what? A lot of this is encrypted and in, imbibed and, uh, you know, and printed in that book as well. Yeah, you yeah. could really get it there. Um, it, it's interesting. I can open the book at any point, and I do it to this day, and I literally open it, and I would read, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, and a few words, a, a sentence, and it totally will connect. It's so interesting. To something that speaks to me or something that I'm about to do or I've done, and I just needed to get a confirmation of some sort. It's mm -hmm. that, and, and that shows me or tells me, of course, um, that when you wrote this book, it wasn't just Santari writing the book. Um, it was Santari as he calls it, of course. Yeah. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, I think to, to be able to do that type of writing, it wasn't a sequence mm -hmm. of um, ideas which together form a book. It was um, moments of something as great is coming through and then we put it down in words mm -hmm. but the energy the feeling mm -hmm. is like what allows you to make it a story so if i take uh, some example like about um when you're walking down the corridor uh, in the cor to the coronation chamber and you feel the crown upon your head well that had significance for me at the time of writing because that's how it felt it felt like there was this presence that was with me and it was talking about how um, kingship was originally bestowed. It um, was almost like um, the right person was given the power and the authority um, literally into their hands so that they could rule with this wisdom 
and with this insight. And um, it was almost like there was a benevolence about it. So it is those um, types of um, ideas that go into the, the waving of these different stories. And I say it's like there's an army of helpers because it doesn't feel like there's just one person uh, sending me this information, this flow of energy. It feels like it came from different sources at different times. Just like you were in, in a dream, um, you have snippets of something, you, you jot them down. Maybe you've only got a few words, maybe you've got a page. But to make a book from that, you've got to almost like uh, expand um, and ask yourself, what is it that I'm wanting to, to achieve here? Well, it's in the beginning, it's in the, the uh, forward piece to create a source of magic that hasn't been available before. And that, to me, is like, um, well, now we've got something to pin the storyline on. We're, we're making these ventures, these um, explorations into different lands, different consciousnesses to find out what is magic in our understanding of it. How can we employ this um, sense of power and authority and um, empathy and all the virtues that we consider to be important? How can we put that into writing so that people can understand these things, not just as words on a page, but actually embody the energy of the consciousness that these words are um, birthed from? So you know, it's, um, for me, it was a two-year process of well, what's next? But I'd almost like at the beginning, I'd wait for the energy to come, wait for the right moment and then to write. And later it was, uh, after a year, I said I want to now go to the beginning of this book and start to write it as a book. And that again was a different experience. Uh, again, because that was my, really my first piece of writing as an author. I didn't have anything prior to that to, to act as a precedent. It was just, okay, I have an intention here and I want to see if what I want to achieve, can I write a story that is not based upon the fight between good and evil, mm -hmm. uh, good and bad? Can I write um, something which actually has that high level of energy, which imbues you with um, a feeling of you're, you're an amazing being, you're an amazing creation, and you've just been birthed, mm -hmm. and you don't know anything has gone before you, but you're having to understand things in terms of greatness and magnificence, because they're almost like the linchpin of the, the story itself. Can you talk about greatness? Can you live magnificence? If the only thing that's, that's you've got going for you is this thing which seems to be alive in you, which is this fire, this unquenchable fire, mm -hmm. and you realize that, my God, I'm, I'm more than a human being. Mm -hmm. I'm this dragon. <laughs> I'm this different this new sense of creation. And I think that's um, something which perhaps not many people have gone into that genre to talk about it in that way before. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. I think a lot of people, you know, um, get overwhelmed by the drama of daily life and, and they don't allow themselves to soar and be the expanded version mm -hmm. of themselves. So therefore what's happening now, which is exciting, I think, they're starting to be stirred up to, to some degree that there's something more. And that would be the doorway. That would be the gateway, which is exciting to see because we all have to somehow find our own, you know, open gateway, open doorway to run through to that expanded self mm -hmm. in whatever way, you know, whatever journey of life um, or situation causes us to do that. It doesn't matter. That's just a, a catalyst. So using, you know, if this can inspire people listening or watching is using whatever catalyst in your life. It could be like a, a horrible situation of life. It could be something sad, something terrible, but look beyond that and see is that a doorway into a new version of yourself? Cause you could run through that and you use it as a momentum. Um, I find that often the most challenging times in our lives are actually huge um, birthing places, wounds mm -hmm. of creation. And we just, mm -hmm. metaphorically, I mean poetically, whatever you want to take it, it's, it, go for it, you know, embrace it, find that, why not? Everyone, I think, is an artist. I think everyone is born as a soul artist. I don't believe just people who, you know, of course, some have more of a refinement with it, some don't cultivate it as much, but everyone has the potential to be 
a soul artist, an inner artist, and create and be super, you know, that force of creation in all of us is going to be stirred up. Sooner or later, what are you going to do with it? That's the question. What are you going to do with it? Mm. How are you going to use it in a way that not only shifts you and changes you, but it can inspire everyone around you? And that, that's what's exciting to me. <clears throat> Sorry, this morning my voice is a little rough. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that's what's exp exciting to me, Santari and, and Laura, that you know, I see both of you, you know, here you are, you, you run with it. You, you have a spark of, you know, of um, something and you run with it. Uh, Laura inspires me every day um, on, on her Facebook page. She always has something that she shares. She's, she's fearless. She's not afraid to share, okay, I've, I've done this new thing with the children or I've done this. Look, world, it's working. Um, and that's how I, sh I think we model it. It's, um, you know, there's a difference between just doing selfies as a lot of people do today. <laughs> me in this dress and look at me and actually you know taking a snapshot of your world and sharing the magic because through visuals I do believe through visuals we are giving them another doorway as well so I always look at it like okay everything is a tool in consciousness a book a picture a story a poem you know our conversation our, our show Whatever doorway you'd like to choose for yourself today, you you know you're surrounded by them. Look around; they're chambers of and doorways and gateways to enter in um, of transformation. So, and I think when you said um, you know the choices that we're making and the catalyst, you know we're, we're going forward and even connecting back to the book, we don't know what the outcome is going to be, and that's okay. You know, it's this idea of just taking a risk and again having faith in yourself. Um, and trying something, going out on an adventure, taking a journey, and just enjoying that and letting go of any. I think people sometimes can get afraid mm -hmm. of what's to come. And so just letting go of that fear or embracing the fear. Yeah. You know, instead of just even letting go of embracing, because what you said before, sometimes when you feel most afraid or you feel most mm -hmm. uncertain, that's kind of the, that's the, that's the key. Mm -hmm. And that might be an essential piece mm -hmm. to something magical that's about to happen. Mm -hmm. I think what you find in um, reading the book and some other people have commented on this is that um, your identification with dragons becomes blurred. You find after a time they are the dragon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I seem in the writing to suggest, and I put it there sometimes um, in an unconscious way, that um, this whole thing about dragons, we're not defining it what, what they are. Per se, but you have a feeling of something that is powerful, and that uh, feeling of something powerful, um, I you know I sort of suggest is it emerges in you, and when you're that you're unshakable, because for me a, a dragon can be this creature which spans universes, and uh, it doesn't know fear. Fear is not a thing in the vocabulary, but uh, greatness is, and um, when you are with a group of let's say children. You're there for the play. You're there to listen to the, the fun and excitement and the chatter and their particular views of life and their views of dragons and how they would see themselves perhaps as a dragon. And I think, you know, you encourage that because something in you is so powerfully true that it resonates something in them that they feel um, confident in being open and uh allowing the experience um, to be so natural and um, that it's nothing to be afraid of, nothing to try to get. It's something which already is. So, you know, that's what the, um, the play upon magic really is. The magic is there already. Yeah. We are the magical beings. We're the mm -hmm. magical beings who are just waving our fingers as if they're magical ones and, hey, presto, things seem just to seem to happen. And uh, that's the that's the power about when you're doing something with people. Sometimes you have to use your hands, and they get mesmerized by the way that you're using your hands, mm -hmm. because they somehow sort of know that you're working energy. Mm -hmm. And when you're working energy like that, mm -hmm. it's sort of like you have a, this field mm -hmm. in which everybody is part of that field of energy. They're part of that field of greatness. They're part of that field of wonder and delight and joy. And there anything, anything that you might talk about that's a fragrance of life. And they feel the, the nature of that. They feel that that is something that they would like 
perhaps to talk about. And when I go back to um, um, looking at the book again, I'm looking at it now with having read through Shakespeare's Othello and mm -hmm. the Duchess of Murphy to see how those characters <laughs> actually perform on stage uh, their particular roles through the eloquent use of language, mm -hmm. sometimes with devious means, sometimes with very figurative language. Mm -hmm. uh, but here I noticed that I've used language in a particular way, which is to evoke people to their sense of their own empowerment. Mm -hmm. that they are the dragon, that they are the source of magic, that they are whatever they wish to be and choose to be, and that it is over to you. Yeah. Speaking of, of um, Imagica again, but first maybe we should mention, Laura has done that in her classroom. She has, um, just for herself, she has moved her hands and her fingers <laughs> in a way that we call mudras in yoga, yeah. and um, because every element is on the fingertips. And so just by doing that for herself, she was doing it just for herself, as she was walking the leaf. Oh, yeah. Um, was the, well, the story. You, yeah. Well, so Sazri, last year you taught us, I'm not sure if it has a name, but it's no, the pattern. Yeah. That's the, yeah, the other Ramadasa pattern. And um, I was just walking around doing it in class. I didn't want to make it um, a big intentional thing. I was just walking around doing it in class, and the students started noticing that I was doing my hand. <laughs> What, what's this pattern that she's doing? And they start, um, you know, focusing on their own energy. And then all of a sudden the room got so quiet. Because I, I started doing that because they were getting really boisterous and energetic. And I said, whoo, in order to keep my cool, I need to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so I know, you know, I, I can at least maintain some energy. Um, and so I started doing that. And they were looking and they started following and even now, I like all students now, they're freshmen, and I had them last year as eighth graders, and they'll come up to me and they're like, can you show me that again? I'm having a really bad day. I feel like I'm going to go off. I don't feel like I'm going to be really angry. And I was like, okay, just do some breaths, and here you go. I'm like, oh, I feel so much better. Um, I even had some students, actually one earlier this week, come up to me, and she said, I'm just in the worst mood. And I start to do it, she's like, I already know what you're going to say. And she just started doing it. <laughs> Um, so that, yeah, that's become, I think. But then it evolved. What I loved about the creative side of it, it evolved into something that you called finger patterns. Finger, yeah, finger patterns and hand patterns. Um, you know, there's, I just let them have fun and I showed them some mudras and I said, you can make up your own and just see what feels good and you can share that and you can try to mimic each other's. And so they were at their groups and just coming up with fun patterns with their hands and bringing both sides mm -hmm. together and connecting them. Um, and showing them to each other, and then each other would look at them, oh, how would you look? Okay, so the fingers go here, and they would just... And that was a play aspect. It was a play. It was it really was a play, mm -hmm. but yeah. also a play of energy, because as we know, what they're doing, they're not just saying that, and eventually they'll discover how that shifts their mood and their yeah. state of being. And that's why I decided to do it, because we had to shift activities, and they were, I, I knew mentally they were not in a good place where they could focus, um, and so that's why I was like, all right, let's have some little play time. But sneakily, it's also something to help. Them. <laughs> yeah. But they don't know that. Um, so yeah, they were just playing with their hands. And then once we were done, it was time to work. And they got right to work. It was great. Mm. For me, it was, you know, um, just so inspiring, by the way. Uh, because it opened me up now to, you know, look beyond just the finger mudras that we know which they are passed down from books and from ancient mm -hmm. techniques so yeah there's you know, just you know, <laughs> so, like, you know, like a lot of a lot of the movements through the, the hands as well and i thought wow we're really starting to explore the finer energies of who we are through speaking through using hands through using that is beautiful because, you know, obviously as a teacher, you have to use your hands a lot. I, yeah. I come from Eastern Europe, so I use them a lot <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it, it's, it's a must uh, to express things. So it's very natural, you know. And, um, and what's interesting, when I was teaching kindergarten first grade years back in Africa, I would have dreams that I would... Um, I would wake up with um, the remembrance of myself using my hands to move energy and the children were, were uh, doing it along. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful, you know, and then I would show up in class and then I would ponder at the time I didn't really use these tools as much. It was like way back and eight years back and I was just starting to explore this. And, and 
I thought, that's interesting. And I left it to that. It was a little scary, you know. And that's how everything, you know, everything new comes to us to kind of knock on our door. Hmm, there's something here for you. It's a messenger. And, and of course, I didn't take it farther. I was not courageous and bold. Like you said, oh, finger patterning. You know, it'll have probably both them. <laughs> Because the little ones, the kindergarten first, they needed a lot. <laughs> um, and, well, now it's easy. So anyone watching and observing, they could do their own beautiful, you know, practices. And know that you can't go wrong with this. You can only go with your intuition, right? So there's nothing a wrong or uh, a right or a wrong. It's, a, it's really a, a, a dance in the moment of what feels right to enhance learning, to enhance teaching, to enhance yourself, to just be simply in, in your um, magnificence and shine. Mm -hmm. um, we can no longer hide under, under um, you know, um, whatever, different situations and things um, and have buffers around us. We have to let everything we are shine forth. Our gifts, um, they're amazing and, and we have to just be that light and that uh, magnificence. Uh, is there a moment now that we could maybe read a little bit um, I just what I was about to suggest. Yeah. <laughs> so that we don't we don't have everyone uh, watching uh, or listening all you know excited to hear a little bit of magica. So do you, so do you have a favorite? Oh, he's he's gonna ask you. I think. Oh, he's got it. Yes. It's like a favorite. The uh, paragraph, maybe, or a part of that speaks to you too. And I could look for mine as well. I know I have plenty. I do. I have lots. I just I wish I were marking them. Down. Oh, I do like this part. It's kind of near the beginning when he dives into the cave and there's under the sea. Mm -hmm. It's on page 32. Okay. All right, I got it. How long should I read? <laughs> As, well, um, the part that really speaks to you, go for it, right, Sankari? <laughs> um, I'm page 36. My most obvious thought was that I was not afraid. It took me a while to realize that I was not struggling for breath. Not until my feet had touched the sandy sea floor that I wonder about my need for air. Stephanos was a little distance ahead, so I stopped for a moment to figure this out. I tried to breathe out, but my mouth wouldn't open and my nose seemed to have locked up. It was so strange that my lungs weren't demanding air. Instead, I felt compelled to explore and take in the beauty of my surroundings bit by bit. The small fish made enchanting dances, and as I watched, a giant curtain of light cascaded down from the surface of the water. Somehow it seemed to ripple and look alive. Stranger, though, was the sense that there were other figures around me, moving around in the gloom. <laughs> You're mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get the book. Where do we get the book? I'm sorry. <laughs> I remember um, the inspiration for that piece of writing. It was um, when I was doing a uh, dive off the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and uh, it was my first uh, scuba dive experience. And um, the instructor, of course, gave me a little bit of what to do, and then you were just like under the water for a few meters. But it was that feeling about, oh my God, I'm breathing underwater, you know, and, and it isn't a problem. And uh, then the ability to be able to look around, taking your surroundings, you know, that's like about, underwater you're sort of like thrashing around, but this was like a moment of calm where you could appreciate, you know, and the, the shaft of light, I saw that. If there was this shaft of light that was like a cascade, it was like an aurora borealis, the way it uh, just seemed to move. And uh, a, you know, a giant fish came up very close to as well, a Napoleon Rass. And it was just like, wow. <laughs> you know, it's those moments which just seem to hang there for you because they make such an impression. Mm -hmm. So that was the part of the inspiration for that piece of writing. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I love that part. 
For me, it was like another mystery, inviting you in to read more. So I was going to ask you, I know you have the PDF copy and also the, of course, the, the print copies on Amazon. Um, but the PDF, can you tell us a little more about where people might be able, after they uh, view this uh, interview, they might be intrigued to get their own copy? Well, um, on my website, www.santarigreen.com, S-A-N-T-A-R-I, green is in the color, dot com, uh, there is a, um, a subhead for writings, and there I talk a little bit about Imagica and give the links for the PDF and where you might go to um, get the book on Amazon. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I think the, um, the possibility is there for doing an audio book as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we leave as a project for next year. Yes. <laughs> there is a, um, a piece of writing which I haven't finished, but it is a lead on from Imagica, mm -hmm. which is talking about the journeys of uh, two of the children who are mentioned at the end of the book. Uh, now, these children have got their own sense of adventure and uh, their own complete personalities. And uh, what they're seeking to do is, of course, finding out about. Um, the, well, they meet Merlin and they want to, to know what Merlin's projects are and he's talking about um, getting a new sense of intelligence, a new sense of physical embodiment. Um, you, know, you could be the design, you could be the designers of that. So it's like again an invitation to not take things as they are but to explore your physicality, to explore your thoughts which uh, bind you to physicality and to um, which lead you to know things uh, beyond what you have been taught in school or in any other education um, facility or what you've read about or you've seen on the internet etc the wisdom which is um, really you in a sense but which doesn't have limits so when you start to employ um, that sense of wonder to to want to know where do I come from or or rather what is it that I'm seeking to understand in this moment then you're you're bringing something into play which really is perhaps a focus for your life which will change you know the the character of your life but until you ask those questions until you go on that type of exploration, then you're following a particular trajectory, I would say, that doesn't lead you to this other realm of possible adventures, this other realm of possibilities where your life can take on uh, unimaginable um, consequences, good consequences. <laughs> and the mystery becomes, you know, um, a beautiful journey. It's not a scary one anymore. That's what I found through my own life path. That I was a, I was very scared at the beginning years back when the mystery came into play and invited me in, and I had to work with myself and let go of my you know illusions of being afraid. And then once you enter through that door, you are more of the mystery. Now I just I get tickled. I'm like, what's next? Oh, it's mysterious. Oh, let it. Be more mysterious because I don't have to. I don't have to predict it. I don't have to. And, and what, what, whatever shows up, it's all perfect and beautiful. So that's the beauty of accepting, you know, and surrendering to the mystery and not being. Oh my gosh, it has to be a certain way. And if it's not this way, you know, the whole perfectionism thing has to kind of melt a little bit and dissolve and tone down because that can really affect us and hurt us in our uh, evolution here. If we're evolutionary people, we have to look beyond all these boxes that um, human mind has put into place for the rest of everyone. And kind of, you know, we've been breaking them and, you know, bursting out of them. And, and now we look and there, there are no boxes. In the end, there's no box. And um, we sort of thought, again, it was that illusion, like that here, there's a box here. Well, there's no box. So all along, we, we sat there like a bird in a cage with an open uh, a door of the cage and she just sat there because out of familiarity or comfort you know um, she was afraid to get out through that door but the door is always open and I think that's you know these these doorways these doors you know whether it's a piece of writing again or it's magic or whatever just go go for it um, you know you might find something of yourself that pieces of yourself that you never thought they were they existed and uh, 
you know, I'm finding pieces of myself through my work. I'm sure Laura is through her work, mm -hmm. bringing this new creativity in in different ways. We're finding pieces of ourselves and we're getting excited and keep emerging and keep rebirthing and keep being phoenixes and, you know, <laughs> dragons and whatever else. Mythical <laughs> creatures are going to be, right? <laughs> <laughs> Marrying, fairies, okay. unicorns and everything else. Never to right, is it, isn't it great to have the conversations? <laughs> These conversations. <laughs> yeah. Without having to wonder, do dragons exist? <laughs> <laughs> One question to ask. Ask a child, they'll tell you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so I think that's probably it for, um, yeah. for this conversation. Yes, we're we're so so excited to have Laura here. And perhaps we'll have her again. Yeah. Um, she has so many things to share. This was just a tidbit, but it, it's you know there's so much to what Laura does that really touches my heart, and I'm just so honored and blessed that she's here with me today, and not just coming through the screen over there, but she's actually physically. <laughs> <laughs> And um, um, yeah, and I'm just so thrilled that she's part of my world, um, and all because of, of the love and the passion we have for children and education. And, yeah. I like your mantra. There is no box. <laughs> <laughs> I can walk around. There's no box. There's no box. There's no box. <laughs> There, there never was. There you go. <laughs> it's a good way to say it. Language is beautiful, isn't it? I love language so much mm -hmm. because, you know, it's a natural way of empowering ourselves. How we speak, how the vibration of each word comes out, and how we literally manifest through the words. Mm -hmm. The nuances, mm -hmm. the connotations. Mm -hmm. yes. It's incredible. Yeah. And the tone of the voice, it's, you know, Santari again can talk to us later about that. The power of your voice, the power of writing, the power of, you know, all of this is related in our daily life and how it, you know, it applies. Mm -hmm. So. But for now, we can say goodbye for the Quantum Creativity Show as we have some new adventures to attend to in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> and we just want to thank all the listeners and the, um, you know, everyone watching this um, wonderful segment with Laura Love Ridinger interviewing <laughs> today. Um, and I know the beauty of the, our show is that uh, whether it's in October 2015 or uh, 10 years from now, this is still, you know, imprinted in consciousness, this whole conversation. And that's the beauty of what we love to do. So thank you, Santari, for co-creating that with, uh, with me for, for a little while now. It's a wonderful show. And thank mm. you, Sarah, for being and Thanks for coming on. Yes. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah. You're very welcome. <laughs> Until the next time, then. Until the next time. Bye. Bye for <laughs>